and over to you. And thank you for, an for the introduction. Um, I've done this work actually with uh, Stephen Kell and Francesco De Panardelli. And uh, yeah, my first slide is maybe going to bother you a bit. As a programmer or computer scientist, you've probably seen this a lot. And you never liked that, ever. So what's your first reflex? Because now you know what to do, it happens a lot. You fire up a debugger and ask for a backtrace. OK, uh, my question for you now is, how is this working in real life? OK, so um, you probably know that these things here are addresses, and actually return addresses, that are stored on the stack. So for each function, nested function call you have, you have one stack frame. And the first thing in that stack frame is usually the return address uh, to where the execution should resume uh, after this function has been executed. And this is exactly what the debugger leverages to print you that backtrace. But now, the next question is, cool, you have a stack, but you have different sizes of uh, stack frames. This means that you cannot just go to the top of your frame and retrieve the return address. That's not as trivial as that. So how do we actually get that address? Well, easy. We have a base pointer, right? Um, what if you don't? See, for instance, C++ has deprecated the use of base pointer for a while now. And you can reach cases in which you have only the stack pointer, which points at the bottom of the stack. And you have a bug. So you're right in the middle of the function. You have nothing to help you here, right? So you definitely need more data to do that. And this data is um, the dwarf debug, uh, dwarf debug data, and more specifically, the dwarf unwinding data. So this takes the form of a big array, uh, way bigger than that, actually. And it is indexed by the program counter. And for each instruction, it maps to some expression that tells you how to compute the um, return address location on the stack. So you have a frame address, which is just a matter of uh, relative addresses, and the return address relative to that. OK, well, problem solved, right? We know how to compute the base address now, and we can retrieve the return address, fine. But if we actually look at what's on the program, it's not as simple as a neat array. Well, that would take space. It's this. What the hell is this, actually? If you look a bit closer, you will see like register, fine, register, fine, greater or equal, what the hell, shift left, really, what? So that's actually a bytecode, a bytecode for a Turing complete stack machine that runs on demand at runtime to reconstruct this table we had before. So um, if we recap a bit, your compiler actually generates codes for two machines, your processor and the dwarf virtual machine. This means, in particular, that if you ever used GCC-S to generate the assembly of a source file, you got that. So uh, you were probably in interested in the black thing, the actual assembly. And you might have noticed, maybe, these .cfi stuff, and not actually cared in us to know what it is. Uh, well, this is inline dwarf. So your um, compiler actually generates inline dwarf here. That turns into that bytecode we've seen. This means two things. First, it is comparison to generate for the compiler. Uh, because, well, you have all these optimization layers. You want to keep the dwarf in sync with the code you had in the beginning. And that's complicated. So your compiler might do it wrong, which leads to bugs. And you don't like bugs. And your compiler might actually not do it at all. Uh, for years, OCaml didn't have any dwarf generation because there was cumbersome to generate and they were too easy to do that. And it was really hard also. And this means that for years, you could not use GDB with OCaml. OK, that's not nice at all. But what's even not nice is that if you write inline assembly yourself, because you might want to do that if you program a system or whatever, you must write yourself inline dwarf. You might never have heard of dwarf, but you have to write this nevertheless. Otherwise, your program will do weird stuff. And this is a real life problem, problem right? In uh, glibc, for instance, you have this, which is handwritten, 
a programmer actually wrote that, which is in line dwarf, right in the middle of some file called uh, low level lock. And um, well, this is glibc. So this is experienced programmers. They really know what they're doing. They're really experts. And nevertheless, they had enough by one error in the unwinding data. And as a result, if you ask for a backtrace and the wrong location, you get this. You get a duplicated stack frame. Well, it's not a duplicated stack frame. It's actually a duplicated printing of the same stack frame because GDB didn't manage to make it right. Uh, OK, that's maybe, well, you can laugh at that. It's not really that important. We can carry on working. Well, what if it was another error that made GDB, GDB just unable to print you a backtrace? Then you cannot work. That's not nice. You don't want that. And let's make a bit more context even in real life. Um, a few years ago, someone in the kernel mailing list uh, offered to use the dwarf and winding data instead of base pointer in the Linux kernel. And uh, what this, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you have to notice that this is actually complex and slow. And uh, even worse, this is pervasive. So you have providers using that, debuggers. And even worse, the C++ exception runtime. So this means that uh, if you have an exception in C++, it actually triggers the unwinder, which will look at the dwarf bytecode, which will interpret bytecode to, ch to catch your exception. So this is not only for debuggers, really. It's not. And this is what I was telling you about Mr. Torvalds. Uh, his reply was that. Sorry, but last time was too f painful. The whole and only point of unwinders is to make debugging easy when a bug occurs. But the dwarf unwinder had bugs, and our dwarf information had bugs, and blah, 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 total undebuggable hell. And worse than that, this was seven years ago, and we are still there. But there is some follow-up. If you can mathematically prove that the unwinder is correct, even in the presence of bogus and actively incorrect unwinding information, and never ever follows a byte pointer, I will reconsider. Well, this gives me a bit of work, right? This is our goal today. And for that, uh, we want to do uh, correct by construction tables by synthesizing them. Let me start with a simple example. You have this um, bit of assembly here. We don't really care about what it does. It's a bit of assembly generated by a compiler that was nice enough to generate debugging informations. And let us reflect a bit on that. This means that we have a compiler that generated the unwinding data. data. This is not necessarily the case. And we have a reliable dwarf interpreter, which is not also necessarily the case because dwarf is complicated. And you might have bugs in the uh, interpreter as well. But let's assume that. At the beginning, um, before running this push, you've just executed a call queue, probably. So you're in the state just of the call. And you know by, um, well, by construction that uh, the frame address, by convention, is the stack pointer plus 8. And the return address is offset of 8 by that, which means that the return address is just below the stack pointer. This is correct in the standard C++ CABI. And uh, OK, that's correct. Let's execute that push. What it does is uh, it decrements the stack pointer by 8, meaning that now we have a return address at RSP plus 16 minus 8, which is RSP plus 8. Correct. Fine. We do that again, and we have RSP plus 16 overall. Now we have to execute a MOV that has nothing to do with the stack pointer. So the result is that we should not uh, change anything in the unwinding data, and we indeed don't change anything in the unwinding data. Well, I could go on forever, but the point here is that the unwinding table captures an abstract execution of the code because it was able to predict what was going to show up in the blue area. And this means that actually it is redundant with a binary. So hopefully we can synthesize that and synthesize that correctly. Well, this was only a simple example. Uh, how would you do that in real life? Plot twist, just like that. Uh, when you enter a function, just as we've seen, we know that the frame address is RSP minus 8 and the return address is CFA plus 8. Cool. The semantics of each, each instructions are known. This is assembly. We have semantics for the assembly. And we know how it changes the frame address. 
um, with a symbolic execution now, we are able uh, to synthesize the unwinding table line by line, just as I did. And uh, we had no control flow here. But uh, I just use a forward data flow analysis. And the usual uh, hard part is where you figure out your fixed points, if you have loops or whatever. Well, the good news is that they are immediate. I don't have time to go into details, but you can have a look at the article. They're really immediate. So we implemented that on top of CMU's BAP, which is Binary Analysis Platform. And since it's, this is the last day of conference, I won't bother you with technical details. Let's do a demo instead. OK, so I have here uh, gzip, which is the usual, the usual gzip you all know about, the compression program. This is really a vanilla program on which I just stripped all the unwinding data. So let me look at that. Uh, this has no unwinding data at all. OK, let's try to run GDB on that nevertheless. I know there is a function called zip in there. Uh, by the way, can, every, can everyone see with this font size in the back? Cool. Uh, oh, oops. Thank you. So um, I know there is a function called zip in there. So I'll just put a breakpoint here. And then run the program on some data that is, well, some totally randomly generated data to make a bytes of it. And I reach my breakpoint. Now I will step uh, to assembly instructions and ask for a backtrace. Whoops. GDB is a bit lost. But as you can see, it doesn't crash because you cannot crash GDB. It's not possible. I've tried that a lot, and it's not possible. Uh, let me step again twice, and now, well, it's totally lost. You don't even reach the treat file function. Well, that's not really fine for working, right? So let's try and synthesize the data. So I take my program, gzip, and synthesize that under gzip.synth. It takes a bit of time because, well, it's a big program. And let's hope it works. And maybe it did. Uh, let's look at the unwinding data. It has quite a lot. Let's do exactly the same on, um, on the synthesized program. So I break at zip. I run it on the exact same data. It nags because, well, I have already a file. I don't care about that. I run that already. It's normal. And I'm at my breakpoint. I step twice and ask for a backtrace. And I have a backtrace. Cool. And what if I step twice again? Well, I still have a backtrace. So cool. It works. OK, let's get back to the plot. Um, we've seen that there, was, there were two problems. The first was that it was unreliable. And the second is that. Well, dwarf is slow. So slow that if you've ever used perf, you know the um, standard uh, profiler in Linux, uh, you know that there are two phases in perf. First, you run your binary in a record mode, and then you analyze the data provided by the, uh, the record phase. And uh, you would expect that perf runs the unwinding uh, online when the program is running and it has the stack by hand. Well, actually, it is way faster to just every millisecond or so stop the program, dump the whole stack into a file somewhere, and then unwind it later, because the unwinding is really, really, really slow. So, uh, well, that's a performance issue, as you can think. But it's also a privacy issue, because imagine you're profiling a program including some private data. You don't want your stack laying around your hard drive for years because you didn't clean that up and didn't knew it was saving your stack. So actually, the perf guys are a bit worried about that as well. Uh, so uh, our approach was to try and compile these unwinding tables. <clears throat> so. You've seen that the approach used usually is to take this bytecode 
and at runtime compile that, well not compile, um, interpret that into these tables we've seen at the beginning. Um, our alternative approach was ahead of time to compile those bytecode into some C code. You don't really have to read that, but it's morally a big switch around every program counter. And um, then compile then that ahead of time again using GCC into an ELF file. So it's another shared library which I call ehelf, and uh, which provides exactly the same features as the original bytecode. So, uh, what you usually use for unwinding, if you've done that in your life, is usually you go for libunwind because it's the most common library there. And what I did is that I modified slightly libunwind to make libunwind ehelf that supports ehelfs. It has exactly the same API because it's a slight change. So that means that you can just relink and play that. It means you can LD preload my library and you can use anything that would unwind uh, seamlessly. And now, what's our gain in performances? Well, actually, it's quite good. Um, I get 15 times the performance I have usually on gzip and 25 times the performance on Hackbench. Uh, Hackbench is actually, you've maybe heard of it, it's a tool uh, that is used to stress test the, um, the scheduler of the Linux uh, kernel. So uh, let me emphasize a bit here. Um, we don't actually have uh, 15 times better performance on the perf report overall. It's just about the unwinding time in perf. But I've just checked the figures, and it's about 60% of the time. So it's a quite, a, quite a great improve. And of course, you don't get that for free. Um, Dwarf was designed explicitly to be compact. So we are not as compact as Dwarf. But we are quite reasonable still because we have something between 2.5 and 3 times bigger data only, which is still reasonable if you want to do heavy profiling. So now, what lies ahead of us? Well, we have synthesis. If we had a nice comparison tool, which is not trivial because you've seen uh, dwarf, da dwarf data is a bytecode, so you don't compare easily bytecode. But if we had that, we could verify the unwinding data generated by compilers by checking whether there are discrepancies. That would be nice because there are bugs in the unwinders and uh, dwarf generators of the compilers. We could integrate the synthesis directly into compilers and debuggers so that, so that you don't have to write your dwarf by hand yourself anymore. That would be nice. That would also be a nice fallback method when everything else fails. We could also integrate that into perf so that we can uh, unwind at runtime online. That would definitely be nice. And there are probably way more cool projects we could do with that. So I will be happy to take any questions now and uh, come and chat afterwards if you're interested in that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, really cool. So I have experience working with each frames, uh, etc. Uh, there is a special uh, section, each frame HDR, uh, to speed up uh, search of uh, each frames. Uh, do you measure your unwinding speed up uh, with this section and without this section? Uh, I did not do that, actually, uh, but I'm pretty sure that Libenwine takes that into account. So I mm. most probably benched against the fastest version there could uh, be uh, in a state of the art. Uh, but I, I didn't try without the HDR, you're right. Yes, uh, uh, HDR is just a binary search table, so it's, uh, it's interesting to see uh, if it's not provided, what kind of speed up uh, uh, might be. Mm. Uh. I also tried, well, the um, best speed up feature by Libenwind is actually caching. Libenwind is all about caching everything you ever compute. Um, what I tried is that I tried to turn off the caching, and when I turned that off, I had a 40, uh, 40 times speed up. Oh. So, yeah. And uh, uh, 
Dwarf is not only format uh, we have uh, for unwinding. Also, we have Microsoft uh, unwinding format, and uh, ARM is, uh, has another unwinding format. So do you have any ideas uh, whether your results can be applied uh, to them as well? So. Uh, to be completely honest, I didn't yeah, yeah. even look at uh, Microsoft's format, but I think I've heard once it's pretty much the same as Dwarf. I'm not 100% confident in that. But if it is, yeah, we could compile that, definitely. Uh, I mean, can you synthesize this script or uh, algorithm can be used to just create uh, this table and uh, for any platform, any target? just cross computation some kind of it will be good yeah definitely <laughs> thank you thank you let me ask you is is dwarf documented somewhere in a real yeah. yeah it's totally documented uh it's even a standard actually it's an open standard yeah. so you can uh, look up the pdf it's like 300 pages pdf for the whole format because it's so complicated. <laughs> uh, well, actually, to be entirely fair, it doesn't only uh, do unwinding at all. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of other debugging data in there. Everything that GCC, for instance, generates with dash G is in the dwarf as well. So the, tri the 300 pages are not for unwinding only. Oh, wow. Yeah, we'll get a microphone over here. Just... Uh, sorry. Um, I use Dwarf 5, yeah. Given that Dwarf also supports all kinds of other data, um, does your correct by construction unwinding information work with that? Um, that's a totally different approach, actually, because um, one of those other data that Dwarf supports is, for instance, type informations. And I have entirely no clue about how I could synthesize type data from the assembly. Certainly. So yeah, I only look at the unwinding data. And that's orthogonal, so you don't have to touch anything? Yeah. The uh, well, my, actually, uh, my current approach is to synthesize an EH frame altogether. So that would probably erase the existing data. But that's just because I didn't put any engineering effort in that. And yeah, most probably we could merge that because it's two different sections of the elf, uh, of the dwarf section, actually. Right. So that would probably be something you want if you yeah. try to apply this to. Yeah, definitely, of course. All right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you again. Thank you.